Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist, and I'll be your moderator. We're excited to welcome Dr. David Wong as our speaker today, as he will share the three keys to implant dentistry. Before we get started, we've got a few reminders for you. At any point during the webinar, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will answer them live at the end of the webinar. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. Dr. Wong, happy to have you back. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate you guys and uh, for giving me an, a really awesome topic uh, to speak to you all about today. Um, it's three keys to implant dentistry, and but unlike our, our previous topics where we've talked about you know the, the ins and outs of implant dentistry and surgery and that that type of stuff, we're going to talk about the key essentials to to mandatory technology that that you need. Uh, versus kind of just the toys that we kind of have and that are fun to play around with. Then we're going to segue into the referral relationship between uh, dental specialists and general dentists. And then we're going to talk about case acceptance because I, I don't really think that that topic gets enough love. So let's go ahead and dive right into this. Uh, I hope to keep you guys, it's about four o'clock right now. So we'll probably be on for about an hour. All right. So for those of you all who don't know, I've got two accounts. The first one, which is my main one, is, is david.wong.dds, where we just kind of answer all the general questions, you know, about life. And then, of course, we have, uh, I've got my surgical account, Plaque China, if you guys are interested in periodontal surgery or, or dental implant surgery. So follow me there. As far as today's objectives, real simple today. We're going to first start off by different, differentiating between must-have and nice-to-have technology. We're going to discuss the nuances of building a referral network for implant cases. We're going to talk about coaching patients through their treatment plan to improve case acceptance. And then um, we'll kind of, the biggest part is I hope to hang around for some questions. Uh, the reason that is because with those three topics, we can talk an infinite amount of time on, you know, how to build your referral network or how to, how to present a case um and get patients to say yes to treatment so we could really talk for days about that so we only have one hour but anyway i want to start off by by telling you guys a story about last year you know something that we all lived through which was the pandemic and the lockdown that that ensued so nothing teaches you about must have versus nice to have items than a good old pandemic and, and let me start with this case right here and this this is a case that i treated on march 30th 2020, which was week two of the supposed two-week lockdown, which of course ended for us in Oklahoma on May 4th. So I get a call from one of my best referring doctors who lives 90 minutes away from me in Edmond, Oklahoma. And this is a 72-year-old gentleman. He just snapped off his, his bridge. And as you can see, he's got some hopeless teeth. So he, you know, my 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 buddy, Dr. Michael Chandler in Edmond had referred him to me and he said, Hey, you know, we're in, we're at the end of lockdown. You know, do you, do you mind seeing this guy? Do we consider this an emergency or, or not? So the challenges here is, is that, you know, it's kind of global because everybody was in a different spot in regards to lockdown here in Oklahoma. We were supposedly on the last day of lockdown, which that day that this gentleman came in, they actually extended the lockdown um, a couple more weeks further. And then the, a couple more weeks after that even. So we had some ethical questions during the 2020 lockdown about whether or not we should treat this patient. What's considered an emergency? Do you have to be dying from this or is it just something that, you know, you, you can't, you know, uh, do, carry out your day-to-day -day, um, act routine? Um, we, we had some issues too, trying to figure out how to diagnose this case from 90 minutes away because this gentleman's out of town. And then we had some ethical things going, you know, you know, between Tulsa and Oklahoma City, which is also Edmond, you know, is there are there any ethical issues having a 72 year old man drive from from one hotbed to another? Um, I had some other challenges because my dental team was on furlough. Um, we didn't know how long lockdown really was going to be. And my dental lab was closed. And, and of course, we had the, the ethical concerns like, like I just mentioned. So to, to address some of these challenges, fortunately, we had some technology that was working in our favor that we've been employing for quite some time and where, where we could where we could do some distance uh, examination, diagnosis and, and uh, treatment planning um, from afar. So as far as the diagnosis goes, it was really cool that 
that uh, we, you know, my referring doctor had a CBCT. Uh, he had a scanner. So he could actually, you know, share with share with me some models and some ideas. Radiographs, of course, are digital, but mostly the CAT scan. You know, that was really helpful uh, for us to, to be able to see if we could help this patient and to really go through the details because I didn't want to handle, unlike a lot of people that at the time, I didn't want to handle this case like an emergency clinic where we're just like getting the patient out of pain and putting him on, you know, pain pills and things like that. Um, ethically, I got to be honest, I, I didn't think about this too long at all. Um, I think people on Instagram were, were uh, debating this case a lot more than I would, uh, than I did. Um, what was going on, going on through my head was where else would the patient go? I mean, do you really want this guy ending up, ending up in the, in the emergency room? Uh, what is my duty as, as a dentist who's trained to do this? Um, what about the risk of delay or incomplete care? You know, what if he just goes to an emergency clinic and just gets the hopeless teeth ripped out? Um, and, and once again, with, without, you know, knowing when lockdown would be over, what, what is my ethical duty um, as a periodontist? Um, having no employees was not that big a deal because we actually had, it's not like they didn't want to work. It's just that we were close. So I was able to call two of my uh, best team members and they came in to help me. As far as communication, because, you know, we're working from, you know, 90 minutes apart, the digital technology that we utilized once again was the CBCT. Um, both of my referring doctor and I both have had a digital scanner for, for impressions. And then we, of course, did our Zoom meetings, just like a lot of other people. Uh, there were some things that we couldn't do, and I'll get, get through that with this case. Um, but it also helped that we, we both were educated about the, the dental implant process, uh, which I'll touch on later because my, my referring doctor uh, was also trained in dental implants and does some of his own dental implants too. And I'll share with you why that was actually uh, a, an advantage for us here. So let's go here. So this gentleman comes in. I haven't even seen him yet. This is just his photographs. So you'll see that we can gain a lot of information about this gentleman uh, just from the CAT scan. We can see um, that he's that we have to you know, extract number seven, eight, and 10. Uh, number six and 11 appeared restorable based on our mutual consult via Zoom. Uh, when we looked at his CAT scan, it looked like he, he needed some uh, bone uh, added at the time of the extractions because we had some uh, uh, bony dehiscences. And we also had a, a severe atrophy in the, in the area of number nine. So immediately, you know, right off the bat, I can tell Dr. Chandler that, hey, send your patient up here, be prepared. Uh, we, we were going to have to take out three teeth and do a ridge augmentation and wait the appropriate amount of time before we do the, the implant. So I'm going to, this is not a surgical uh, webinar today, so I'll, I'll kind of blast through this. But anyway, we took out the teeth. The patient had a lot of bone loss. Uh, we knew this because I, I use a plan mecha Pro Max. We were able to see all this, and my, my uh, strangely enough, my, my referring doctor uses the same CBCT as well. We were able to uh, put our bone graft in, and when I, I actually posted this photo on on uh, Instagram, and the whole thing blew up in the in the comment section. Uh, everything ranging from praise to you know needing my license pulled. Uh, this is the uh, suturing, and here's what I was talking about. So you can see at the bottom of your screen, March 31st is when I when I actually posted the uh, posted that photograph, and you'll, you'll see the comments and the debate that this thing spark uh, that this thing um, sparked. Uh, so you know, <laughs> my, my buddy Doctor Doctor Dean over here, you know, he, he's got his popcorn up because the the comments literally blew up because we had so many different people with various opinions. Um, but at any rate, uh, we were able to to get this gentleman into a, a temporary bridge. Um, so the bridge looks like this because, you know, unlike normal, we would have a lab, you know, we'd have a nice prefabricated, you know, bridge and everything. Uh, we didn't have that advantage here. So, so Dr. Chandler had to do everything by hand. And of course, you know, our, our patient has some parafunctional activity and things. So by the time we were ready you know, to place the implants, strangely enough, my lab in, in California, they were still closed. They wouldn't even accept digital scans. Uh, which I thought was kind of weird, but but at any rate, I, it, this uh, pandemic showed me a lot of things. Uh, we were able to treatment plan uh, his his three implants for number seven, eight, and ten, and uh, got a surgical guide from from a different uh, from a different lab. So I, I got to to meet some new friends at, in some new places in uh, with a lab in Alabama instead because they were open. 
Um, here's our implant placement. So still utilizing really important technology with it, the CAT scans, um, as well as the digital scanner and sur a surgical guide was made so we could you know, place these implants in, in very, very nice restorable positions. But here's where, here's what the kicker though. The, the new lab that I had, um, they would normally, you know, make these custom healing caps to make the, the soft tissue look really nice. Uh, we didn't really have that advantage. So I had to hand make, uh, some custom healing caps here. Uh, and this is probably not, you know, the best job, but it's, it did the trick. And, and what I'll show you, share with you is this, by making these custom healing caps, it made my referring doctor's job really mm -hmm. easy. So, you know, my, all I had to do is send him these, um, impression cope, uh, these, uh, scan bodies actually that they do double as impression copings, but, uh, these are the scan bodies from bio horizons. So they, they double as, as a, uh, impression coping or a scan body, just whichever you want. Uh, because my buddy uses a scanner, he just, you know, popped them in there and scanned it. And you can see, you know, with our knowledge of, of custom healing caps, the soft mm -hmm. tissue stays wide open so that we can get a, a nice, uh, easy delivery of his teeth at the, at the uh, final mm -hmm. outcome here. So what I want to get at here is, is number one, I want to thank the team uh, with, with me and, and my my buddy Dr. Michael Chandler, uh, we've been we've been working together for years and years and years. Um, I just think it's got so many cool implications. You know, when we talk about the pandemic and all the stuff that was going on at the time, um, we, we were able to help help this gentleman out, and he's super happy. So, so I thought that was a good way to kind of share with you all what is essential and what is not so essential. So. You know, before all this pandemic stuff, we would sit, you know, I would sit and meet face to face, uh, knee to knee with my referring doctors. And we would look at the CAT scans together. Matter of fact, this is uh, another good referral, uh, referring doc of mine, Dr. Joe Massad. He's owned the covered dentistry today like a bunch of times. And, and I'm uh, merely riding on his coattails. Um, but we would normally meet face to face. And, and nowadays we, we really don't. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of a lot of you all probably do um, a lot of a lot of virtual you know, exams and, and consultations. So what technology I feel is essential you just cannot live without. You cannot live without a CBCT um, in my eyes uh, and do a, and do a good job. I mean, I think you can. Uh, there are people who say that, hey, we've only we, we've used periapical films and and panos forever. Um, but I will tell you, a CAT scan, if you really want to do a, a, the best job that you can do, you got to have a CAT scan. Um, digital impressions are a huge, huge help. Uh, and the reason I love them is because they're so accessible and, and they're so useful in so many different areas. Not only do I use it, you know, for, for our implant impressions, but of course, in, in restorative dentistry, you use them for impressions. In ortho, you use them. And it's really, really cool because when we're working on a case with, you know, myself, uh, an orthodontist and a restorative dentist, you know, usually the digital impressions actually comes from the orthodontist. And that's pretty cool because he'll just send them to all of us and we can make we can make transitional partial dentures. We can make, you know, we can make surgical guides. Um, we, can, we can make temporary crowns on implants. We can do so much stuff with this. And it's really neat because you know, it really connects all the specialties. Um, the other thing that I, I really love to have is, is the piezo surgery unit from Acteon. Um, I want to show you that one here in a second. But I think the nice to have things would have been a printer or a mill. Uh, just, you know, kind of kind of like I'm going to show you uh, show you the one from Plan Mecca here in a second. Um, but it's it would have been so nice because our, our labs were closed. We could have just, you know printed our own guides, you know, made, made our own, you know, restorations or custom healing caps and that type of stuff. That would have been nice to have. Uh, like I showed you, it wasn't a deal breaker because we, we could do some of this stuff by hand, but gosh, it would have been nice. Uh, the last thing is the resonance frequent, frequency analysis by Austel. Um, this is nice to show, for those of you who do implants, it's really nice to show you uh, without harming the patient whether or not your implant is ready uh, for the final restoration. Um, so I'm going to show you this video real quick. This is the Axion Cube. Um, I'm going to turn my volume down. 
this is the Acheon Cube. And what it's nice for, as you can see here, um, what we're doing is just is it it basically jiggles that broken root out uh, out of that socket so that you can just reach in there um, and just and just grab it with the with an instrument. Um, it's really nice, like in a case like this where you have a pretty thick buckle plate. The last thing you want to do is drill through it to retrieve it to retrieve a root that you broke off. So we use the piezotome um, from from Acteon. Works really nice that way. You can just you know stick in here with a little you know small little uh, Woodson elevator and just pop that root right out. So look into that. Great machine if you like to do a lot of surgery or if you like to take out teeth atraumatically. Wonderful, wonderful piece of technology. Uh, the last thing that I showed you was the Austail machine. This is really neat because we have, for those of us who do implants, we're constantly bombarded with patients who want to get their implant restored in a hurry. They're always like, is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? And you always feel like the bad guy. I kind of feel like I know how orthodontists feel. You know, whenever patients are wanting to get their braces off, you feel like such a bad person when you when you tell them that they're not ready yet. The Austail machine works on resonance uh, frequency analysis. So it's sending you know, little uh, sound waves through this little pin that's on the implant. And it's going to shoot out a reading. And what's nice about it is, is you almost kind of like, you know, <laughs> deflect the responsibility onto the machine. So if you uh, if the machine, for example, on this one, you'll see that it has a number of 65, you know, 70 is the number, you know. So if, if it hits 70, then we're ready to go. If it doesn't hit 70, we're just not ready to go. So it's it's kind of nice to have something objective that we can show our patients um, whether or not, you know, they're it's ready for their implants, uh, their implants ready to be restored or not. So anyway, this is the Austel machine. They have a bunch of different uh, types of models. Uh, so check it, check into that. So going back to what's essential, what's non-essential, I showed you one piece of the plan, NECA fit system. And the reason that is that the other part of the system is going to be their mill. And I really think that would have been nice in my office to have. So the quick poll question here is, do you all want to learn more about the plan NECA fit CAD CAM system? Uh, just a simple yes or no. And uh, we'd love for you to get some more information about it because I really think uh, this is something that I wish I would have had a year ago for sure. Would have made my life a lot easier. Um, as far as this uh, thing goes, to, it's very, uh, very, very neat for those of you all who, who you know have other you know types of systems. I love Plan Mecca. They always make a quality product for me. As far as the, the the scanner goes that I have, I've got the Plan Mecca Emerald. I know there's a bunch of other ones out there. Um, and they have, they're all, you know, priced differently and, and that type of thing and have different uh, features and benefits, but, uh, I've got the plain Mecca Emerald and then the other half of that, of course, would be their, their mill. So anyway, check into that. Hope you guys click yes. So you can get some more information. So whenever we're talking about, you know, ref referring patients during lockdown, um, with so many different opinions and, and different experiences and, and, uh, and things like that, trying to refer patients from, from one office to another, you know, you got to have a pretty special relationship, you know, with your referring doctors. So what is the key to developing relationships like this? And why listen to me? You know, what do I know? You know, I'm just some guy uh, that's been uh, just a periodontist who's been in private practice for, uh, gosh, for almost on my 18th year, 18 years now. So, there's really no reason to listen to me, but I will say this. I had a, I had a standout year in 2009 uh, where the Wall Street Journal actually did an article uh, on my office talking about marketing. And in that, in that article, we talked about how big social media was going to be for dentists and marketing their, their practice. And uh, I did get the, the you know, got that part of it right at least. And then that segued into a, a chapter into the Wall Street Journal's uh, Complete Small Business Guidebook, which, as you can see here, I mean, it was a very popular book. It's ranked uh, 1,261,140 as of, as of last year. So anyway, it's, it's in there nonetheless. Um, but anyway, that's, that's my experience as far as the dental business goes. The one thing building re referring uh, relationship, uh, attracting new patients, and helping them to say yes is all about. So we're going to talk about that 
And that word, of course, is influence, right? We know about influence with social media, but in real life, it's really, really important to be able to influence people, Um, not manipulate people, not trick people, but to really genuinely influence them uh, to make decisions that are good for themselves. Okay. So one question people always, or a comment people always have for me is, you know, you're probably a good influencer just because, you know, you have a good personality or you know how to talk to people. So the question always is, can influence be learned or are you just born with it? And for me, I believe that it can be learned. There are some people that are better at it than others. But for the most part, I, there are definitely a, a there is definitely a system that you can incorporate that can get you tried and true results. First thing that you guys have to understand about a dental practice is it, it's a dental business, right? We all run a business here. So all businesses depend on two things to survive. What are those two things? First thing is new business. Second thing is repeat business. Without those two things, we don't have a place to practice. So how do we get new business and repeat business? Um, We're going to start off talking about the referring uh, relationship. So if you're a specialist, we're going to talk about that. Uh, If you're a general dentist, refer to a specialist. We, we, We want to talk about that, too. Um, so we're, we'll focus on that referral relationship. I can only speak from a periodontist perspective. The challenges of dental specialists is trying to get new patients, especially in, 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 for a specialist. We generally have a short term relationship with our patients. You know, we, we, we get them, we treat them, and then we send them back. Um, the second challenge, of course, is case acceptance, because after you do your exam and present a, a treatment plan, you, you hope they would move forward with treatment. Um, I can tell you specialists are always struggling with what type of technology uh, to, to buy and incorporate. We don't really know what to buy. We don't know what people like. We don't, you know, we were trained in residency to honestly get away with a bare minimum. So we don't really know what, what to buy and where to invest our money. Uh, sometimes we're, 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 we get mixed up on what mix of services to provide. Uh, as an example, for me and Perio, I debated for a long time on whether or not to do with, to take out wisdom teeth. You know, I know some perio, uh, periodontists do, some don't. I don't, you know, but but um, that that's a challenge too, trying to figure out what your service offering is going to be. And then lastly, how do you how do you build a referral? I mean, you know, if you ask you know specialists thirty years ago, they would say you know you bring food around to all the general dentist offices and and they just refer your patients. But I don't know that that's true anymore. So what I do is I focus on the relationship side of it in my practice. So we're going to talk about building referrals. Um, some other strategies that, that we commonly employ as specialists is we socialize a lot, you know, go to a lot of dental events and meetings and study clubs, probably start a study club if we don't belong to one. Uh, we focus a lot on word of mouth because, you know, when you're when you start up a scratch practice or if you're a new associate, you know, you really have to go out there and hustle and, and get get those patients uh, so you depend on word of mouth at first, too. Um, a lot of us try to focus on our expertise as a, as a uh, specialist. Uh, we try to become a source of knowledge or maybe even an expert, like on the news or something like that. And finally, there's those of us like myself, you know, who invest a lot in technology and buy all the latest and greatest stuff and, and really hope that that uh, people, you know, like that and, and, and or at least like it enough to want to check out our office. So let's look at these strategies and, and, and see what's really, what really matters and what really doesn't. So when I focused, I'm going to go backwards here for a second. I focused early in my career on becoming an expert and, and uh, investing a lot in fancy technology. And what I realized today, 18 years later, is that, you know, I didn't really separate, those are all clinical goals, right? I wanted to be the best periodontist and to be trained in the best techniques and use the best, you know, technology and all this other stuff. And, but those were all clinical goals. You know, I wanted to be a good clinician. The question really is, does a good clinician make you a, does it make you a successful clinician? Um, so I needed to have some business goals. You know, I needed to know how to get new patients, how to make, how to build referrals, uh, a referral network that was loyal. Um, I need to get case acceptance because, you know, some of these, Implant cases, they can get kind of big. You know, you start getting to these all on X you know, type implant cases. How do you talk to patients about that? Or if you're, you know, if you can imagine, you know, when I started my practice, I was 27 years old, you know, and I had hair. 
So how do you how do you present a big case, you know, to a 65 year old, you know, man or whatever when when you look like a boy? So it's kind of hard to hard to do that sometimes. So the question for you all is, is when patients and referrals choose you, what are what are they actually buying? I mean, are they are they buying you because you you are you are the best at what you do or you have a, a fancy machine? You know, the it took me many years to figure this out, but they're really just they're buying you. You know, they're sending patients to you because they like you. Uh, they bond with you. They trust you. Um, they they probably know you're not the best. I mean, I think if we're all realistic, I mean, um, you know, <laughs> those most of us are probably free to admit we're not the best at what we do. But people like us for for some reason. So let's go over some common myths about why people come to see us. No, excuse me. Number one. One of the myths that I had, I, I moved from an old, old office that was a thousand square foot. And now I've got this 4,200 square foot office. I then it, this it addresses item number one here. If I only had a bigger or nicer office, people would send more patients to me. Number two, I need more CE. I need to become better at what I do. I need to you know, learn better techniques, get more certificate, certificates and qualifications. Myth number three is I need more technology. If I only had this X machine, then everybody would have to come, you know, come see me. So myth number one, if I only had a bigger, nicer office, let me show you what my first office looked like. It looked like this. From 2003 to 2012, this was my practice. It had a, I had a four, a four chair, you know, seating area and the reception area. My building was built, I believe, in like 1958. Um, only had two ops uh, to start with. Ended up uh, with three. But now, you know, this is my practice today from 2012 to, to now. So quite a big difference visually. One is certainly nicer than the other. But did that translate into more business? Um, this is my consult room uh, back then compared to what it is now. And I'm actually in this room right now doing the, doing the webinar. Um, it didn't. It didn't at all. You know, and the reason that it doesn't is because does it attract a little bit more? Maybe. But if we're talking about your ref, your best referrals, your referral relationships that are loyal to you, it didn't make a difference at all. Myth number two is I need to get smarter. You know, I need to go take I, I need to become a CE junkie and learn all the stuff about dental implants and oral plastic surgery. And for you all, if you're a restorative dentist, maybe you think you need to go to XYZ center and go through all their levels and become a mentor and all this stuff. Um, maybe you feel like you need to do that. And if, if you were to only do that, then the patients would just come, come at you in droves. Um, I can tell you it, it doesn't, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the biggest things that we talk about when we're talking about practice development and practice management, one of the saddest things is, is, is watching a dentist go into debt you know, taking a lot of CE and all their knowledge that they gained stays up here in their brain or on the shelf. It doesn't end up in the patient's mouth. So talks like this is something I think we need more of so that we can speak openly and honestly about what it takes to actually get patients to move forward. I thought when uh, this is early on in my career, 2005, I realized that in Tulsa, there were no board certified periodontist, not one. There was one in the town over, but there was not one. Matter of fact, there hadn't been a board certified periodontist since 1969. And when I got my board, and when I was boarded, um, I made sure everybody knew about it. You know, I, I had this plaque and I sent out flyers and newsletters, emails, mentioned it in all my talks. Hey, you know, I'm David Wong. First board certified, board certified periodontist since 1969. And boy, I was like, why wouldn't everybody want to go to the only board certified periodontist in Tulsa? Well, it doesn't work that way. That's not what gets people to see you. So they're not, they're not there for your certifications all the time. They're mostly there for you. Myth number three, I need more technology. This is another sad thing. We buy, you know, all these big machines and things like that, but we have no, we don't have the people or the communication skills to deliver it uh, to patients. So 
you know, I thought, you know, we're going to buy all this stuff. And now, you know, like I've said, some of the stuff has become essential. But I'm talking about, you know, 15 years ago, you know, I was buying this stuff and really expecting people to to just come see me just because why wouldn't you come to the only board certified periodontist that has the best technology? You know, I had lasers and all this other stuff. Why does why doesn't it why doesn't it work that way? Well, turns out if you do some research, we pick people to refer to and to do business with in general, not just dentistry. We pick businesses and people that we respect, you know, that have strong management systems and things like that. This was in Barron's um, uh, back about 12 years ago, I believe, is when this uh, article was in there. But if you look at why people choose to do business with you, they're looking for a good, a good business model, a good person, somebody that they can click with. You know, they don't really care too much about, you know, you don't, you don't have to have uh, the nicest office or the most expensive technology. You don't wear, need to wear a silk suit and a tie. You know, those are all things that I've tried. I can tell you I've tried and I can tell you it does not matter if I show up in scrubs and a, and a lab jacket or, or if I show up in a, in a suit and I've done the suit thing and man, doing a suit in, in a in Oklahoma summer is miserable, but I, but I tried it. The competitive edge thing is where I was focusing. And you'll, you'll see here that of these five categories, competitive edge is the last thing that people looked for when it came to um, uh, doing business with people. Competitive edge was last. So it really made me rethink of, you know, what, of where I wanted to go uh, with my practice. So I really wanted to focus more on myself. And, and I'm, I promise this is not going to be a self-help uh, webinar, but, but it, I decided to focus more on myself and my practice. And, you know, with, with me, if you guys follow me on Instagram, you guys know my motto it, for my office is TCOIS. And, and it's, it's uh, take care of your shit. And that's how I run my business. I mean, people, that's how I run my practice. That's how I treat my patients. That's how I treat my staff. And we take care of your shit. I mean, that's what you got to do. And I apologize for cursing, but that's what we do. And people know that. We don't have these mission statements on our wall that nobody can remember because they all sound the same. This is this is TCOIS. And, and for a while there, we, we wore them on our T-shirts every, everywhere we went. So patient, patients choose us. Um, so they're buying, they're buying us. So we really need to focus on, on ourselves here. So what about us and what can we say and do and make people feel to help them click and bond with us? So the first thing is we need to instill confidence in our, with our referring doctors and our patients. And how do we instill confidence in them? Well, uh, we'll go to that. Okay, sorry. We need to instill confidence. We need to provide value to them uh, with our services, with our business offerings. We need to be attractive to them. And I don't mean you know, hair and makeup. I mean, we have to have attract, attractive features with the way we make them feel. And lastly, we need to display leadership. Right. Nobody wants anybody wishy-washy. People want some somebody who can lead. And that's that's what these are the four things that we're going to focus on. Confidence, value, attraction and leadership. So there are three ways that I like to use to instill confidence with my patients and my referring doctors. Number one, and this sounds cheesy, but you got to listen. You know, a lot of times specialists are too busy telling, 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 telling. And you got to listen. Listen to what people have to say. Why are they in your office? They're in your office for a reason. You got to figure out why that is and what they want. If you want to know a secret about them, you need to share a secret. So that's confide. That's what that's what builds confidence. As soon as two people share a secret, they have they build a bond. So whenever you uh, are a dentist, as an example, and you go, "Hey, I notice you don't floss." Guess what? I I don't floss as much as I should either. That will will definitely instill a little bit of confidence between you two because you've shared a secret. Social proof is really important as well. And what social proof is is that word of mouth that we were talking about earlier. If you if if um, a patient hears hears or sees your name over and over and over from somebody at church and then somebody at work and then you know maybe on a social media 
a post or something, and they keep seeing your name over and over and over, they start to build some confidence that they're in the right place. As far as building value for a patient or a doctor, we got to provide a, a good service, okay? I think I've established my, my perspective on, on what level of service. It doesn't have to be the best service, but it's got to be good service. It's got to be a good price at a good value. Now, price, what I want, you, what I want to make sure that you guys are, are aware of, price is different than cost, right? Price is just the money. Cost is the money over time. So we're trying to build some value for the patient. And lastly, you got to deliver. You got to be, you got to be effective at what you do. So you got to provide good results. If you don't do that, you're not provide. You're not. They're not going to sit around just because you know you have a really cool coffee machine in the reception area. So you got to deliver some good results. Laws of attraction. Having charisma does help, and not all of us are, are charismatic. Um, but having an affinity for people uh, means finding things in common uh, between you and your patients, or you and your doctors. Um, this goes to the point of that's why we don't ever talk about sex, religion, or politics, right? Because those are ways that we can alienate other people and even ourselves. So we try to find topics um, that we can that we can click on uh, together so that we can um, you know attract the right types of patients that are like us. Um, once again, you got to listen. You know, listening to people it gets you a long ways. If we'll just talk a little less. And listen a lot more. We'll get we'll get you a lot, uh, very 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 far. Um, attraction, uh, other other laws of attraction. You know, people like people that are fun that make them laugh, uh, that can share an experience or an outcome. So doing a lot of testimonials and things like that, uh, showing vulnerability, uh, sharing stories, going back to that social proof that I just mentioned. Those are really uh, big things in, in attracting uh, attracting people and building a bond and trust with you. Lastly, leadership. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't really get into leadership, but I would say leadership in this sense just means, you know, have a good reputation, you know, have a good reputation and be confident in your treatment planning and be confident in your treatment philosophy and, and how you run your practice. And, uh, you know, when it, once again, when you, when you get that word of mouth going, I know a lot of you all are just starting out. Uh, but trust me, once you get that word of mouth going and everybody starts seeing your face and your name everywhere, uh, you know, you, you people kind of ordain you as a leader in your field, even though you may, may or may not be. So how did a bigger, nicer, more CE and, and more technology affect my patient referrals? Once again, it did. And it was a shame that it didn't. But it it. It was a blessing because and then I learned to, to focus more on the things that people did like, which was things in myself and in my practice, in my team members that, that they grew to like. And that's what attracted cases, uh, the most cases. Um, I want to int introduce you guys to the, this concept called co-opetition. It's a uh, obviously a play on words because it's, a, it's cooperation and competition uh, combined. And this really describes the specialist general dentist relationship perfectly. Because, you know, what, what's funny is, is in the old days, you know, dentists and dentists just referred to the dental specialist and then we treated their patients and we sent them back. Um, but then it got to the point where, you know, specialists would sometimes keep the patients, you know, like in perio. And then that would get the dentist mad. They're like, I'm not never referring a patient to you ever again because I send them to the, the periodontist and I never see him again. Well, that created a thing where, Dentists wanted to keep all the perio uh, in house. They they didn't they didn't ever want to refer a patient ever. So there was a little bit of competition there. And now you know what we're looking at nowadays is, is this concept of co-opetition where we have cooperative competition. For example, for me, we're talking about dental implants. I love that my referring doctors, a lot of them, do their own dental implants. I love it. It works really good for me. It's done nothing but help my implant business. How it works. The old model works like this. If I've got a patient that's got X amount of dollars, he's either spending it with you or he's spending it with me. And I don't want him to spend it with you. So that means that if, I, if he's spending it on you, he's taking water from my cup and pouring it into yours. That's kind of a competition way. That's the end. That's a uh, uh, kind of a... Uh, 
a, a zero sum game, so they, so to speak, because what I lose, you gain. Coopetition is more like these flames. It costs me nothing to light your candle, more or less. To put it this way, it cost me nothing to light all these candles. And that's why I'm here sitting in front of you all sharing with you my experience. I don't gain anything by it. But if we can all if I can light everybody's candle, we're all going to grow together and we're all going to prosper. It's not a zero sum game. So concepts and I won't bore you with this, but this is an old book, by the way. It's not a new concept at all. 1997 is when this book came out. It's. Collaboration, you know, when we're working in a team approach, you know, with the periodontist, orthodontist, the restorative dentist, oral surgeon, whoever, um, we can collaborate to save costs and we, we don't have to duplicate steps or reinvent the wheel, which is exactly what some people think you're doing whenever you refer out. But it's not true. We actually do things a lot more efficiently because we can break our big projects down into more bite sized, manageable pieces. We also share the risk. That way, if you're doing like a big all on X case or something like that, or, or a case where uh, you have so many different um, disciplines going on, we can all share the risk and also remember what we were talking about earlier and how to bond and build trust. By sharing the risk, we're also you know building trust with each other and the patient by providing social proof and confidence uh, with the patient. By doing co-opetition, we can play to everyone's strengths so we don't have to be bring our A game in every single piece of, of the patient's treatment plan. We can just do our part really, really, really well. More players. This is the part that I think is really cool. It's this concept called uh, the value net. And whenever we are in a co-opetition uh, type scenario, we increase what we call the value net. And the value net is comprised of five components, your practice, your patients, dental suppliers, other competitors, like other periodontists for me or oral surgeons. But then you have these complementers. And this is really cool because once more people get into the dental implant game, just like when more people got into the perio disease game with all the other, um, the, the non-surgical treatment, the antibiotics and that type of stuff, it introduces a whole new world of periodontal patients to people like me, you know. So when people start doing implants, they, they start seeing more implants. They start seeing more opportunities for complementing uh, procedures like bone grafting or soft tissue grafting. So it only helps us all when we increase the size of this value net. It can all, co-opetition can be summed up with one of these, the, my favorite quotes from Zig Ziglar, who I got to see live and in person in 2005, he says, you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. And that, my friends, is, is true. So with my last 15 minutes, I'm going to try to share with you the art of case presentation. Um, this is something that I have invested a lot of time in. I'm going to give you the best 15 minutes I've got. Uh, once again, I, we, we, I've taught whole weekend courses on this before. But if you guys are going to screenshot anything or write anything down, write down this pyramid. There are five steps to a, how a patient says yes. Number one, every patient, just like every customer, every client, starts from an area of unawareness. We don't even know what's going on. We don't know what we have. We don't know what we need. If we don't know any of those, we don't know what we want to buy or invest our money in. So we have to go from some level of an, an unawareness up to having giving attention to it. So we got to go from unawareness all the way, have some awareness of, of the situation, and it's got to grab our attention, right? Now that we have our attention, you know, meaning you know, maybe you didn't know, you know, periodontal disease uh, can cause heart disease or has an association with heart disease. Maybe you didn't know uh, Invisalign was a possibility. You have to have some attention. OK, so you go from unawareness, you grab their attention. Then they have an interest. OK, because sometimes people are, are aware of things like a broken tooth and they just let it go. They have no interest. So we have to go, we have to take them from a level of unawareness, grab their attention, gain their interest, have them make a decision. Hopefully the decision is yes. And then 
take action. Okay. Because we've all, and the action part is what we need to focus on too, because a lot of times we want to buy something or we want to do something and, and we, and we just don't do it. We always say we don't have enough time or something else, you know, got in the way, but we got to get our patients through these five steps, unawareness, attention, interest, decision, and action. Okay. The most common mistake that I see in case presentation, and I can tell you, I used to videotape myself in, in case presentations with the patient's permission, of course, but I literally would set up a camcorder and on those big VHS tapes and record myself. And I would say the most common mistakes that I've ever made, same with many of you all, is they don't have a case presentation system in place. They just sit in a consult room or, or even worse in a, in a dental chair and just talk to the patient randomly, you know, like your buddy, buddy or something. And then, you know, you might talk about treatment and then you kind of go to something else, but you don't get anywhere. You know, the patient isn't progressing through that pyramid. So the basic formula for case presentation, and this is the most basic formula, by the way, I, I use several other formulas, but this is the most basic. It's P-A-S, okay? That's your, your basic formula for case presentation. What it stands for is problem, agitation, and solution. So in order for you to get your patients from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid, you got to introduce the problem. You got to agitate them, right? You got to, you got to make, you know, make, you, you have to make a case for why it's a problem, right? That way they can gain their attention and their interest and desire, right? You, that you want them to have, <laughs> to make a decision on, on your potential solutions. So that's why it's problem, agitation, and solution. Okay. So let's talk about interest. So there's things that we do um, that, that, you know, like many of you all, I'm in study clubs and we're provided with these videos that educate people on why an implant versus a bridge, right? Or we talk about, you know, what is calculus and, and why is that bad with periodontal disease? I love these things. They're good visuals. They spend a lot of time and money on them. But the problem with them is that they're just informational, right? They're giving the patient information. There's no story. There's no interest. There's no buildup. There's no suspense. There's no resolution. So we need that. And I'm going to tell you guys how to, how, how to structure a story. You know, if, if your idea of educating the patient is giving them a, an iPad uh, with a video from your sphere education and just having them play the video and think all of a sudden, wow, I want my whole mouth reconstructed, you're wrong. If it happens, you know, you might, you, might want, you might want to rethink that patient. They might be a little crazy. Most people don't make decisions that way. Big revelation. People do things for their reasons, not mine. So you can't just tell people, you know, what they need, what they need, what they need, what you would do, because they have their own reasons. They got to this point in their life by making choices for themselves. This is also going to be something that they do for their own reasons. These next three tools, I love them. I use them every single day, and they're called the dreadful story. Number uh, two is we're going to play it. I play a game with my patients called healthy or not healthy, and then I also do a thing called youth or elder. And I learned these techniques. I didn't make them up. I learned from them from a mentor who's also like a grandpa to me, Dr. Michael Schuster uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, wonderful guy, great communicator, taught me a lot about what I'm showing, showing you guys today. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with this man over the years. He's now retired. But uh, this is back 2014. This is the last uh, communications class that I ever taught, that I remember teaching anyway. Uh, it was a whole weekend uh, back January 19th, 2014. was the last time I taught a whole weekend on this. So it's been a while. So that's why it was such a treat to be able to put this together for you all. But the game of healthy or not healthy, this is what I like over anything that's pre-canned on an iPad. I love having my own photographs. So what I do with a patient, if I see something in their mouth, I take a picture of it, and then I have photographs, and I just tell them, hey, do you want to be healthy or not healthy? There's not a single patient on this planet that says, I want to be, I, I don't want to be healthy. They all say, I want to be healthy. So all we do is we just play a game. If, if I'm looking at, you know, gingival recession, I'll show them recession cases and we'll play a game of healthy or not healthy. And the purpose of this type of exercise is to get them thinking about number one, 
you know, just image recognition about what's healthy and what's not healthy. And then they start to form an opinion about what is healthy and not healthy and where they want to be. Um, so we, this is what I, what I will typically do is just play a short game. Doesn't have to be very long, one or two minutes of healthy or not healthy. All right. And most, most people, they don't have to be dentists to figure this out. They know what's healthy and what's not healthy. As we're doing that, we're supposed to be gaining their attention and interest. Okay. And that allows us to bring in their own pictures so that, uh, you know, we can, make some changes so that they can meet the goals that they are now stating that they want. They want to be healthy. Some people don't communicate in terms of healthy or not healthy. Some people are more motivated by feeling old or looking old. So with these same two photographs, we can, we can switch the game and say, Hey, we're going to play a game of youth or elder. You know? So when you look at these teeth, who's the older person, who's the younger person, Right. Generally speaking, the healthier mouth is the one that looks younger. So we, we play a game of youth or elder. So this is all about communicating in a way that, that a patient uh, likes to be communicated with. Uh, sometimes, like I said, people are, are motivated by health. Sometimes people are motivated by, you know, looking young or old. Okay. So it's a little bit, it's kind of fun, actually, to put together uh, a presentation, you know, depending on their communication style. So we look at these cases, you know, we have a wear case and then now we have it fixed. So now we have a before and an after. Does this patient look younger before or does she look younger after? Well, she looks younger after. Well, what happened in the after? She got, she got a, lot of, a lot of dental work done, you know? Do you want that? Why wouldn't you? you, you do you want to look older? So it, it's a pretty easy decision, you know, for patients. The last tool I use, and I use a bunch of tools. I think last time I checked, I've, I've got like 40 different types of stories that I do, but I'm going to give you my top three. So, so far, we've talked about healthy, not healthy. We've talked about the youth or elder uh, game. And I'm going to use the last one, which is called the dreadful story. Every one of you all should have a dreadful story for every little scenario in, your, in, in a common treatment plan for a patient. This is my dreadful story for an extraction bone graft and implant. Okay. So here's the dreadful story. This is Anna. Anna is, uh, Anna is an accountant. She shows up in April of 2012. Okay. April's an accountant. Uh, I'm sorry. Anna's an accountant. It's April 2012. She comes into the office. My tooth hurts when I bite down. I do an exam. I show her the x-ray. You, your tooth hurts when you bite down because the root is cracked. And that tooth needs to come out. If it doesn't come out, it's going to affect the other teeth. You're going to have an abscess and lose more bone and you're going to be in pain. Well, it doesn't hurt now because I've been up. My dentist put me on some antibiotics. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're not in any pain. Really, I'm happy that they were able to help you out. But at some point, you're going to have to get this tooth out. Okay. Well, can it wait a little bit longer because it's tax season? And I'm really, really busy being an accountant. No problem. Call me when you're ready. Well, you know how time works. A year goes by, but it only seems like a few months. So she comes back a year later, April of 2013 now. Same problem. Doc, it, it's hurting again. I get the bubble on the side of my gums now. Should I just get on some more antibiotics? No, you shouldn't. Uh, you really need to get that tooth out for the, all the reasons that we discussed before. Well, Doc, it's, it's uh, tax season again. I'm really, really busy. Can it wait a little bit longer? I don't think it should, but okay, it's your tooth. So she waits another you know, year because it's tax season. Next year she comes in. Doc, I really think I need this tooth out. Yes, Anna, I, I believe you do. And matter of fact, I'm sorry to hear tell you this, but you might end up losing the tooth in front of it as well. So this is my dreadful story. Um, I think we all have should have cases like this um, on hand so that we can discuss these with patients because it, it, it offers a lot of, you know, number one, social proof, like we talked about that way they know you're not just, you know, you're, you're, you're not just pulling, pulling the wool over their eyes. Uh, you're, you're speaking the truth. You've got some experience. You've seen, you know, they can relate you know, to cases like this. Uh, and you can do this. I have these for gingival recession as an example here, I've got a patient here, you know, when the patient comes in, you know, my, my teeth are, my teeth are really cold sensitive. 
they hurt. Well, you, you need a you need a gun graft. Uh, that'll get rid of that problem. Well, boy, that scares me. I don't really want to do that. Um, but then they come in a year later, and it's gotten worse. Now, you know, we maybe we're getting the teeth out now. Who knows? But it's important for me to have these types of scenarios for patients so that they can relate to them and they can I can show them pictures of their own teeth as well. So this is a part of my case presentation. Finally, I'll leave you with this, another dreadful story. So I'll go last year to three months ago to yesterday, and I'll just take a progression of, of these, of this same patient. And here I'll show them, you know, how the recession is getting worse. And as it gets worse, they want to brush it less and less, and they lose even more gum tissue and even more bone. In fact, they lose so much bone that now the tooth is starting to, to drift upwards. So, and now it's loose. So it's important to have these dreadful stories uh, for patients just to help them communicate. Uh, com communicate and see uh, the urgency and also to build a desire uh, to move forward with treatment with you. So that's how, for me, that's how I get them to make a decision um, is, is with the dreadful story, the healthy or not healthy, and with the youth elder uh, uh, tools that, that I just showed you. Handling objections, I think when you're doing your case presentation, um, I think you should be prepared to always just automatically handle certain objections. Uh, so for example, the universal objections in dentistry is fear, time, and money. So you've got to figure out how to, how to address their fear, whether or not you're going to, to you know, give them nitrous oxide or sedate them um, or, or share with them other stories. You know, as an example, on that, on that gum grafting scenario, uh, that patient that I just showed you, I mean, she was 20 years old. So for me, I'm like, hey, you know what? I, I do this. I do gum grafts on eight year olds. So if a second grader can do it, I think you can do it too. You know, uh, you know, I'll say little silly things like that in my own personal style. Coming from me, it sounds okay. Coming from somebody else, maybe it, maybe it, it, it doesn't sound right. So do you know? Develop your own style there. Um, time. You know, people are always wondering. You know, why why things take so long, or why can't it be faster? So you should always address how long it's going to take, what the time commitment is, and why it's important. And then, of course, the money. They're always going to ask about money. They're always going to ask about their insurance. Be prepared to answer those questions, right? And you don't need, you don't want to him and haw and, and you know, have to circle back and all this other stuff. You need to have an answer and, and a system in place on how you're going to handle that money question. And then, of course, not having enough information. Every now and then, you'll get a patient who just needs more information. They always need more information. Uh, they're very analytical. Maybe they're an engineer. Uh, maybe they're a lawyer, something like that, to where they're very detail oriented. Be prepared for all these types of personalities and be prepared to handle basic objection questions. All right. <clears throat> so once again, this is this is the uh, model here for case presentation. Always keep in mind where on the pyramid that your patients are at. That way, you know what to do. And patients do not skip steps. They go straight through these steps, okay, one by one. Um, so you can't skip steps either. So as an example, if they're if they're not even interested in, in uh, Invisalign and all of a sudden you're quoting them a price for Invisalign, that doesn't work, right? That doesn't work at all. That, as a matter of fact, I might even get them mad. So or if they're, they're not after, um, if, they don't, if they don't want veneers and you just keep pitching veneers, you're, you're doing a poor job and a disservice to yourself and just wasting everybody's time. So be ethical, right? Always uh, make sure that, that a patient is ready. It, I, I'm sorry, always be, be sure that a patient needs what you're recommending, right? We're not here to manipulate people. We're here to help them uh, get treatment that they need. So I just want to say that. Okay, time to close. Now, I'm going a little bit over time here by a minute, but now it's time to get a commitment set the terms, discuss finances, confirm the arrangement and, and put them on the schedule. So this is where you actually have to push the envelope a little. You actually have to be assertive and assert yourself here. And that's going to be uncomfortable for some people. A lot of people don't like asking for money or a commit. They like talking to people and, and making them your friends and that type of stuff, which I love doing that too. But at some point, it's it's time to move on, right? We got we got to we got to close the deal here. So I'm going to give you six common closes for dentistry. I use like three or four basic ones. I'll just kind of give you. I'll go over the first two, and then we'll kind of blast by the other four. 
And the first one is called the invitational close. It's very subtle and low key. With all these closing type statements, you always use a trial close like, what other questions do you have? How do you feel about what I just said? Um, you know, those are just the types of questions that don't mean a whole lot, but it kind of gets you a feel for, for if they're interested or not, or if they're ready to make a decision. An uh, invitational close for me, I love it because it fits my personality uh, very, very well. And what an invitational close is, is after I say, what other questions do you have? They say none. And I'll just say something like, well, hey, what do you say we get, we get going on this? That's a very soft close. It's an invitational close, right? There's the directive or assumptive close. Um, you always, once again, also leads with a trial close. Like, do you have any other questions? How do you feel about this? It's nice because you get to keep the control. You know, so for those of you who like to talk, you get to talk more. Um, but you tell them what the next steps are. So you basically say, do you have any other questions? No, I don't. Well, here's here's what's here's what we do next. Okay. I'm going to go grab my office manager and she's going to, you know, check with your insurance and answer those questions that I left open just now. And she's going to make financial, you know, talk about financial arrangements if you need them. Uh, and then we'll talk about, you know, the the warranty on your dental work and, you know, what your next few appointments will entail and then what all is included. Okay. So that's the more direct or assumptive close. And then you have other, these other four closes, the preference close, uh, which is really nice because it's kind of like getting a patient to say yes without you know, getting it or seeing that they said yes without actually them saying yes. So something like a preference close would be, you, you know, do you want to do, you know, one quadrant at a time or do you want to do the whole mouth all at once? Right. You're, they're, getting, they're choosing a preference. Um, the secondary close is, is baby steps, you know? So that's, that's where you go, Hey, you know, you, you get them to agree to little things like, you know, do you want to be healthy? If you want to be healthy, we'll start off with, with getting your gums under control. And then after that, you know, you, you just get little, you know, small yeses until you get to, to a full treatment plan. And we've all been victim to that. I'm sure to where you, you, you start, you know, that's how denture centers work actually. Right. They, they get you in the door with a $300 denture. And before you know it, they, they bought the premium denture at, at $2,500. So uh, use a lot of secondary closes. Authorization closes uh, work really well too. Uh, for those of all of you all, like like uh, those of us who write out our treatment plans, like I do, I like to write out my treatment plan in front of a patient, like a cocktail napkin style style close, uh, where we we uh, it's called the authorization close. So as we're agreeing to various uh, phases of treatment, I'll write them down, and they'll watch me write it down, and then I'll you know, I'll tell them what everything is. So it's like very line by line. Very casual. I like that. And then the uh, the I want to think it over close. I don't like this one because when people say no to me, the way my style is, I'm not one of those guys that's ever going to go, hey, so what do I need to do to earn your business? <laughs> I'm not that type of a guy. I can't do that. So if they want to say they want to think it over close, what I like to do is if they want to think it over, if they want to ask their spouse uh, for permission or whatever, I always try to get them permission. Uh, get their permission to stay in touch with them. You know, as a as a periodontist, I want to stay in touch with them. Do you mind if I call you back in six weeks, or do you mind if I, if you're talking to your husband, would you? I did this one today. Would you? Would you want to get on a video conference? Uh, you know, together after after you know you've you've uh, told him about the treatment, and if he has any questions, I'd love to be there to answer them firsthand for you. Um, and if they say no to that, then you kind of know where they're headed. But usually they say yes, which means they genuinely, genuinely do want to think it over. Um, the big one of the biggest tips that I ever got was, was from my mentors and probably one of yours too, Dr. John Coyce in, in 2004. Uh, he spoke at our study club here in Tulsa. And one of the most memorable lines that I, I write that I wrote down was a patient should be comfortable enough w- with you to say no, but still stay in your practice. And I love that because I think if you're a dentist, it's really important that they can say no to you and still feel comfortable to come back to your uh, chair six months later to get their teeth clean, right? Just because they say no shouldn't mean, hey, I guess I just got invited to leave. Uh, they should still feel comfortable. And I think that's kind of the name of the game is that as long as they're there with you, you know, getting their maintenance and, and giving you an opportunity to continue to educate them and help them move forward, that can still be a win. It doesn't always have to be about closing people in one, in, in one visit. So. Um, 
that concludes it. I'm sorry I went about five minutes over. I want to remind you guys to sign up for Thrive Live. I'm on that uh, talking about the uh, future of periodontics and and I uh, talk a little bit about this co-opetition thing that we that I just told you about. Um, but anyway, here's the here's the website. Uh, check into that. It's May going on May 21st. So I'd love to see you all there. And with that being said, uh, if you guys have any questions or just want to, um, you know, have, have need more clarification or something, just just shoot me a message on Instagram, and I'm, I'm happy to chat. But uh, with that, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Awesome, thank you. On the topic of social media, we actually have a question, and it kind of relates to what you and I were talking about before we went live today. Um, they said, what are your two cents worth on social media in the dental community, primarily Instagram, where we're always seeing everyone's highlight reel and can easily fall into the world of comparison. It's really just to start thinking and telling yourself, I'm not good enough. My dentistry doesn't look like that. I'm doing all on X procedures every day. I can become, I can see it becoming a real quote unquote pandemic in its own right. Would love your thoughts. (laughs) I, I love that question. You know, it's funny. I, I, you know, 15 years ago, I wouldn't even be able to relate to this question. I wouldn't even know what you're talking about. But, you know, with Instagram is definitely everybody's highlight reel. So for me, there's two things that I always look for in a good Instagram post, uh, especially when it comes to dentistry. Everybody can do a beautiful process. We can do a beautiful surgery. We can do a beautiful prep. We can do whatever. But I, for me, what makes me always feel better is if they don't show the final product or if they don't show a final product that's been in, in service for a while. Um, so that always makes me feel better as a periodontist that, you know, that hell that thing could have failed miserably. I'd never even know because the last picture they showed was it all sutured up. Um, as a dentist, though, you always have to realize that people use filters and and things to, to manipulate the, the photos. Um, that happens a lot. I can tell you that right now. Uh, so that's one thing. Number two, there's a lot of people who are really, 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 really good dental photographers and not very good dentists. So don't be impressed by really good photography because that 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 does not make a good dentist. That just makes them a good photographer. Um, so be aware of that. Um, as as far as as far as kind of sensing where you're at, you just really need to grab a mentor or two and go, hey. Can I show you something without you laughing at me? I'd, I'd be happy to look at it and tell you, tell you, you know, if it's if it's good, if it's bad. But um, the biggest thing is that there is no comparison. I know that everybody says that there really is no comparison uh, because you know for that given you, you never know, you never know the backstory, and that that's the that's the thing. I wish you all knew some of the backstories on some of these, um, you know where where the final product may be the result of five do-overs and four trips to the lab to get the shade right. We all share the same uh, challenges, all of us do. You know, mismatched shades, broken temporaries, you know, failed all on X's, um, grinders that break off or veneers, people who don't comply with ortho, it all happens, man. So don't, don't worry yourself. Awesome. Well, that's, that's all I see. So you were, you were so on point today. No questions. <laughs> what? Get out of here. All right. Can't, can't win them all every time. <laughs> Fair enough. Awesome. Fair enough. Uh, well, with that, we will close. So thank you, Dr. Wong, for the great presentation. I certainly always enjoy your content. I hope everyone else did as well. If anyone is interested in attending future Henry Shine webinars, visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive this recording via email sometime in the next week. So with that, thank you all for joining and look forward to seeing you back here soon. Thanks so much, everybody.